This is Around the Farm, the podcast about all things ag. You may have noticed I am not Clint Schaffer. Thank goodness. I'm Tom Versman, channel brand manager and rising podcast superstar. Today, we're talking with Matt Bennett, a grain marketing consultant about, guess what, grain marketing. Matt, for those who haven't met you, can you tell us a little bit about your background and your role with Channel? Yeah, so my background, I grew up in central Illinois. Uh, We farm in Shelby and Moultrie counties. Uh, Grew up uh, in a family with grain elevators. So, uh, you know, marketing, I guess, has been part of my life pretty much from the get-go. Graduated from the University of of Illinois. Uh, We decided that we were going to get out of the elevator business uh, back in 2009, and I kind of had to uh, help with the transition of uh, ownership. And so I went to work for the folks that had bought us. And, uh, you know, back in 2012, on the heels of all that, Uh, You know, I was out speaking one day, uh, talking markets, and someone from uh, Channel actually heard me talking about what to do with uh, uh, $8 corn whenever we had the drought of 12. And uh, quite frankly, they asked me to speak for them a few times. And really, long story short, I started with Channel in 2014 in an official role. Um, uh, You know, it's a a contractor type thing, but it's something to where I work basically year round, uh, writing a column three times a week. And then I go out and speak for different uh, events. And, you know, you can kind of see me in a a lot of different uh, roles there just uh, talking about markets and trying to help people figure out what to do with their marketing plans. You bet. Hey, I see you're in your vehicle today. Where are you headed? Yeah, going to Hartley, Iowa. So, you know, uh, one of the uh, young ladies that went actually to top producer seminar uh, and executive women in agriculture uh, went along with Channel, which that's something Channel's done the last few years. And, you know, uh, whenever they've had a chance to uh, have meetings in person and whatnot. And uh, uh, this year she was on that group and we got to talking and uh, she's in Jason Collins uh, area. And so uh, uh, she wanted to know about having a meet. And I said, talk to Jason. He'll get it set up. I've been up there before. And I'd be glad to come up again. So uh, on the way to a channel meeting here this evening. That's great. That's great. Well, hey, safe travels on the way up. Tell, Tell me a little bit about your family and how they're involved on the farm. Yeah, so my family, uh, wife and I have five kids. We live on the Centennial Farm there. Uh, actually, our farm uh, in Shelby County, you know, we, uh, it's been in the family since 1835. So my granddad's granddad built the home. Uh, a pretty neat place to raise a family. But um, as far as involvement goes, my wife's stay at home, which means that she's very actively involved whenever we're uh, farming. Uh, obviously, she's still got to run kids quite a bit. I do quite a bit of that myself. But, uh, you know, it's something where we share a lot of roles. My son, who's at K-State, he's a senior. Uh, whenever he's around, he's able to do most of our cattle chores, and, and he's actually able to do a lot of the field work and whatnot. Uh, he went to school for two years at Lakeland College in Mattoon, which is just up the road, and so he was able to still live at home. So the la- uh, last year, and then of course again this year, uh, having him not around uh, hurts a little bit as far as my workload increases when he leaves. So uh, I've got a 10 year old son, Toby as well, who helps quite a bit with chores. And then, uh, you know, we've got five again, but our youngest, I'll tell you, she, um, she's probably got more pizzazz than any of them. She's just a little (laughs) bit small to be doing chores and driving stuff, but she's ready to go nonetheless. Well, good deal. Well, good deal. It's it's nice to have the extra set of hands, I'm sure, on farm. And your son uh, being away at school, I'm sure that can be challenging from time to time. But hey, education is important, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. It's been good for him to be away from uh, central Illinois too. You know, uh, uh, he's actually uh, been to a lot of events with me uh, with channel over the years. And, you know, he's, uh, he knows a lot of channel folks. In fact, you know, some of the people in Kansas uh, last year, they had me out for a, uh, for an event before one of their football games. And uh, he knew some of the channel people that were there because he'd met them before. So uh, it's definitely been a family affair, not only on the farm, but uh, with what we've done, you know, for channel, this is the eighth year we've been doing this. So we've been doing it for quite a while. No, that's great. And and we appreciate it and love love hearing you and getting out to hear you chat. So let's shift gears a little bit. Market volatility is at the top of everybody's mind. What what tools do you recommend farmers uh, use for risk management? Yeah. And so I think in the past, you know, whenever I went to the University of Illinois uh, back in the uh, 90s, you know, I want to date myself. I'm, I'm, I'm older, I guess. But uh, regardless, we talked about hedging your grain in the spring and that uh, 17 out of the 20 years before I took the marketing class I took, when you hedged your grain in the spring, which was selling December corn, 
you know, and then wait and see what happens with the price. 17 out of 20 years that worked uh, previous to me taking that class. Uh, that was the old style of hedging. Nowadays, you can still hedge like that uh, whenever you see profit margins you like to see. But there's also a lot of other tools, uh, whether it's options or whatnot. You know, but as I, I've told you, uh, I guess here recently as well, I think one of the main tools we have to use is just simply uh, knowing our farm as good as we can possibly know it from a financial standpoint, knowing when we can lock in revenue, uh, profit margins. And the only way we know that is to have all of our costs down to a, a you know, to a T. And so we have to be very proactive, in my opinion, on, on pinning those things down, uh, you know, because we are a business and we should operate ourselves as a business. Not very many successful businesses anyway in the U.S. or anywhere are able to operate without knowing uh, their cost of production uh, very closely and then knowing what return on investment is. And I think that's the way we need to handle our farms as well. You bet. You bet. Is there anything from the ROI perspective that really you would encourage folks to look at on farm? I mean, is there stuff sticking out right now with trends or anything jumping up to you? Yeah. And so I think right now, one thing that we have to be careful with is, you know, we went through several years in a row with, with what I would say pretty tight profit margins, you know, uh, really good times from about 07, 08 into 2013. 2014, we had a big crop and that kind of started uh, uh, towards lower profit margins. But regardless, going out and talking markets from the winter of 2015 through 2019 wasn't much fun whatsoever. Uh, we actually had, um, you know, a different feel than what we have today. Now that we've got really strong uh, commodity prices, I know input prices are higher as well. Uh, fertilizer prices certainly have skyrocketed here over the last uh, year, especially. Uh, even with those higher prices, though, we still have really good margins. And so I've been trying to encourage folks whenever we're looking at our balance sheets and our ratios, uh, in times like these, they definitely need to be improving. I know there's a lot of things we would like to do uh, whenever we get a little bit of cash in our pocket. And I think the farmer uh, historically has been uh, well known for keeping, you know, the money in circulation and, uh, you know, investing in their farm, whether it be equipment or field tile. Uh, but regardless, we have to be very cautious. It's not get over our skis, in my opinion, whenever it comes to spending money on the farm and trying to make sure that we keep our ratios on the improving side when we have the chance to improve them, because you know, there's a lot of years when we don't really have that opportunity. Yeah, you you mentioned there investing on the farm. Let, let's talk a little bit about technology and especially in times like this with inflation and everything going on uh, in the countryside. What what are your thoughts on investing in new technologies to Im potentially improve yield or other features on farm? Yeah, we we've actually gone through a lot of this here recently. Uh, you know, so in the past, I, I went out and spoke at a lot of channel meetings over the years, and you know, Channel had a relationship, or Monsanto uh, had a relationship with you know with Climate and and Precision both at the same time. Those guys would go out and speak, and then I would speak on the heels of them. So they tie their presentations really well together. And I always thought, boy, I need to tie mine in too. And so if I know. Uh, with thermal imaging or whatever it might be, what kind of yields I might be looking at, then uh, that helps with my marketing plan as the year goes on. Well, the other thing is, you know, with the planning technology. And so, you know, I saw a lot of presentations, whether it be on scripts or down pressure, uh, high speed planning, you name it. Uh, it, it. Basically, I was able to <laughs> give those presentations if someone showed me their slide deck because I'd seen it so many times. Well, I decided I need to invest in the same sort of technology on the farm. And, uh, you know, my dad wasn't, uh, uh, super excited about it at first due to the price tag. And he felt like uh, as long as we drove four mile an hour, you know, we'd have really good placement still. And I'm like, well, you know, I, I kind of need to be in a different situation if possible, especially if the technology is out there, because um, I don't necessarily need to go fast on the farm. I just want to be as accurate as I possibly can, first of all. And second of all, use the tools, whether it's changing uh, uh, changing up populations or making sure the right hybrids place in the right areas. But uh, those are the, some of the ways that we've kind of invested uh, for ourselves. And I, I feel like even with inflation, there's no question that most things are going to be more expensive, uh, no matter what you're buying right at this point. But you have to very closely evaluate evaluate where's your money best spent on the farm in my experience in my career you know and my dad agreed with me is that uh, as long as your planning and harvesting equipment is up to date and able to uh, maximize efficiency uh, you're going to be in pretty good shape what was the uh, the hardest thing to convince your dad to try uh probably uh, the funny thing i mean it, it's true though the gps you know at first whenever gps came out you know i would set my line for my dad and my dad thought it was the best thing since sliced bread Problem was, uh, if I wasn't in the tractor with him, 
and he would call me and say, Hey, how do you get this line set again? And, you know, I'm not, um, you know, I'm not a technology guy. I mean, I know technology fairly well, but if I'm not sitting there looking at it now at the time, if he would have been FaceTiming me, I could have easily walked him through the steps, but talk about a person getting pretty angry, you know, uh, whenever they couldn't figure out, you know, how to get his line set. And he'd tell me, uh, you know, bring me my 40, 20 and six row planner. <laughs> I'm sick and tired of this, uh, um, you know, you know, uh, technology. And so, uh, regardless, it, it was hard to try to get him to buy into all that. But then once he, once he did, I tell you, uh, the nice thing is that he realized, uh, when he went home at night, his stress level was down. Uh, he didn't feel as tired as what he did before, you know, especially, you know, when you're trying to plant or whenever you're trying to work ground, you're trying to watch that line all day and trying not to vary too far off of it. It's, you know, I know it sounds like a uh, first world problems, but you know what, it's actually a little more stressful. You bet. And, you know, some of those things we take advantage of today, like auto steer even, right? It's, it's, uh, it's amazing to look back how, how things were done even just five years ago. We talked about trends up to this point. Let's start thinking, you know, maybe six months down the line. What, what are things we should be keeping an eye on uh, throughout the next six months? You know, we had really strong markets today. Corn was up um, over 20 cents. Uh, same thing for beans. Uh, right now, you've got things going on like uh, we had FSA uh, prevent plant acres out uh, this week, and they were a little bit higher than what the trade was expecting. And then, of course, you know, we had, there's a, a crop tours going on galore. Pro Farmer Crop Tour comes to mind, you know, as being one of them that a lot of folks watch. And people watch very closely to see, hey, what's the results, not only on a daily basis at the end of the day, but on Twitter. You know, I'll tell you what, you throw a few yield checks out there that uh, spook people and traders, uh, believe it or not, they're watching that and watching it close. And so, you know, um, right now things are going really well and, it, and it's boosted prices, not only for, for instance, these 22 corn and November 22 beans, but it's boosted prices for 23 as well. And so when we look six months down the road, we got to ask ourselves, you know, at what point, uh, even if we have a short crop, does the trade start to focus on places other than us? Uh, you know, because we all know that we're not the only people in the world that are producing corn and beans to a large extent. And so, you know, the Southern Hemisphere most likely, uh, based upon all predictions, are going to come through with three to four percent increase in acreage this year. Both corn and beans is what the current projections are. You know, so six months down the road, we could have a different conversation than we do what we do right now. So there's a couple of things that come to mind for me. Be, be uh, aware this is a futures market, which means we're looking at it in the future and it's a global market. And so uh, if, for instance, uh, let's say Brazil and Argentina have a really big crop this next year, uh, what kind of yield could we post? I mean, I, I just ask you, uh, what kind of yield could we post here in the U.S. if we get Mother Nature to cooperate uh, with the mm -hmm. kind of hybrids that we're planting these days? Because my personal opinion, I, and I, I'll give you my opinion, but I want to ask you first, what kind of national yield do you think we could post here in the next two to three years? You know, I, I, I think uh, I think it'd be pretty darn good, to be honest with you. Uh, 180s, 190s, right? If we get the right weather. Right. And so, as a producer, you got to ask yourself, we're talking about maybe a 175 crop this year on, you know, about 90 million acres, a little bit shy. But if you add 10 bushels to that, 10 bushels on top of that is 900 million bushels. So you're talking a carry out ballooning from around a 1.3 carry to a 2.2. Two, and that my friends, takes you from $6 corn to $3 corn, most likely uh, in in some sort of a, a fairly quick order, you know, and so uh, you got to understand that six months from now, everything can look completely different. And that's uh, not necessarily always going to depend on the U.S. Sometimes it's large crops out of the Southern Hemisphere as well. So if you start putting back to back to back crops together, uh, we've got to be aware that this could change our bottom line significantly. You bet, absolutely. And, and you mentioned it a little bit, but what, how, how is uh, corn and bean production pricing looking today? Yeah, you, you mentioned it early on, but didn't know if you had the numbers in front of you. Right. And so, whenever you look, for instance, at December corn, I mean, you got up over six fifty today for the first time in in a few weeks. Uh, you know, and November beans are you know closer to fifteen than fourteen. And so, you know, you're looking at uh, prices that during harvest. Uh, it's been, I can count on one hand, uh, the times that we've seen this. And so we're, of course, getting close to harvest. We're not quite into it yet. Most people are not. Uh, but you got to be aware that those price levels, you know, what are the odds that we're going to stay up here or rally from here? And so one thing that I've tried to really work on over the last few years, whenever uh, 
one of my mantras, if you will, is to not get uh, too wrapped up emotionally in the markets. And uh, again, if you're looking at things from a spreadsheet perspective and a return on investment uh, perspective, then in my opinion, it makes it just a little bit simpler to step forward and make sales uh, at extremely profitable levels. And so, you know, a lot of times I'll tell uh, people, hey, Look at it with uh, your business partner, your spouse, or or whatever it might be. Because if you if you sometimes get hung up and really have a hard time trying to make a decision, uh, I know in in my particular situation, you know if I if I tell my wife that uh, you know we could lock in X amount of revenue, and you know she knows what last year looked like, then she's probably going to say, "What are you doing? Not making sales?" And uh, it's good to have someone else kind of bounce those things off of, especially whenever you get into times like this, because uh, we're all. As producers, bullish most of the time, whether prices are high or prices are low, and we've got to be careful with that mindset. No, oh, absolutely. One one of the things you mentioned earlier was um, influence of social media and, and Twitter, even, and but uh, other social media platforms. I'm going to put you on the spot with a, a non ag related question, but tell tell me a little bit of what your thoughts are on meme stocks. Yeah, so meme stocks, you know, I it's one of those things where they've had a lot of press here over the last. A year, especially, you know, and, and, and essentially there's a lot of folks out here that can make predictions or quote unquote recommendations, if they will. Um, and basically, in my opinion, uh, just like talk show hosts, just different people that might say, hey, this is something that people need to be chasing after, you know, and then it creates a frenzy. And anytime that you get multiple people uh, in ho- uh, mass hordes buying something where a lot of folks aren't selling, it drives prices uh, significantly higher. My thought process on some of these stocks, um, I guess, more creative uh, investment uh, portfolio opportunities is that uh, I don't have an issue with them. In fact, I kind of like dabbling as well, but I also want to keep it, uh, in my opinion, uh, not, I don't want to get carried away. You know, I don't want to be going sure. out and, you know, if, if you've got $10,000 to invest, invest 9,000 in, in these meme stocks, like you're talking, um, that, most likely and always going to turn out that great for you. I, I like to keep things as balanced as what I can in my portfolio. You know, uh, I think most of us uh, are investing in some sort uh, or way or another. And I, I just, I, I really preach uh, to try to be very cautious. Uh, and it's kind of like an investment person is going to ask you, hey, what's your risk tolerance? And so if they ask you uh, if your risk tolerance was, let's say your risk tolerance was 90 or 95%, um, some of these meme stocks probably would still be higher higher risk yet than that, you know, <laughs> and we've got to understand what the risk is uh, to putting that money into that. But one thing I'll say, you when you're buying a stock, the, the most that can happen is that that stock goes to zero. And that's not such a bad thing. It's very similar to buying options uh, whenever we're looking at uh, commodities. Uh, and and that's one nice thing is that uh, uh, when you're taking futures positions, <laughs> you know, you can uh, lose your money and then have your uh, uh, lunch handed to you as well. As far as options are concerned uh, or stocks are concerned, the most you can lose is what you invest up front. Sure. And, and one thing I, I feel like I remember you saying before, buy what you like, buy, buy something you know, right? I think there's a lot of, a lot of merit to that. Oh, absolutely. So when I first started trading a little bit, uh, I was in college still, you know, I uh, bought some wheat one time and uh, I made, you know, I don't know, $1,000 on a trade. And I thought, you know, I'm pretty sharp guy, you know, and then the next time I decided I was going to trade wheat again, uh, I bought instead of uh, whatever, I think I bought two contracts the first time. Uh, I turned around and I bought four contracts. Well, uh, then the market went down about 20 cents pretty quickly. And I, I found out it wasn't quite as smart as what I thought it was. My dad said, son, if you're not growing wheat or if you don't know enough about wheat, uh, why don't you just leave it alone? Because sometimes <laughs> if, if you invest too much in something you, that you don't know real well, it's not always going to turn out so good for you. But it was good advice and I've tried to stick to it. You bet. You bet. A question we like to ask all our guests is, what is the best farm advice you've got for our listeners out there? Any words of wisdom to yeah. share? Yeah, and that's a loaded loaded question. I think one thing that I always lean on is, uh, you know, kind of a family dynamics. I think one of the real allure to being on the farm is being able to raise a family on the farm and being able to, especially in a, a, a farm that you grew up 
in on that farm, you know, being able to still be around your folks as they, um, you know, go through different stages of life and then bring your kids on as they go through different stages of life. But we all know that uh, sometimes family farms can be quite challenging too, whenever it comes to family dynamics. And so one thing that I always tell people is to be proactive and uh, to try to make sure that they're doing everything in their power, A, you know, to give the respect due to the generation that gave you the opportunity to farm in the first place. You know, and I've always told my dad, you know, whenever you're ready to retire, that's uh, fine. Uh, that's your choice. You know, you've earned that right to make the choice on when you want to do that. And then as far as my son goes, and I've got a nephew that is kind of wanting to farm one of these days as well. I've always told them if you're going to come back into the farm, you know, one thing like, for instance, with my son, Bo, getting his education, uh, he's out at K-State right now. I'll tell you what, uh, come back and make the farm better, you know, make it more efficient, figure out a way we can diversify, figure out a way, uh, maybe if you've got all farm income at the start uh, to where you're not going to be strained financially and, and be able to not put a strain on the farm. Because, you know, if the farms make an X amount of dollars and there's, let's say there's four pieces of the pie. Uh, you know, you add a fifth person and there's not a piece there unless someone takes less than what they were taking before. Some families are okay with that, but in tough times, you know, some families just simply can't afford to do that. Yep. You bet. You bet. Is there anything you want to plug um, anywhere our audience can learn more, find more about you? Yeah. And so if they don't currently get my newsletter that I issue through channel, they just go to the channel website and you can get there. Uh, there's a place you can go to marketing. I believe it's under tools, you know, and then you can also get the channel profitability calculator that I put together, which, uh, you know, uh, there's an extension of that that I actually have. Uh, that you could find uh, on the on the app store. It's called agmarket.app. And so basically I took the calculator and, you know, I, I continue to work on it and try to figure out ways to uh, continue to improve it and give people a, an opportunity to, uh, you know, know what their bottom line is, uh, know how, for instance, yields impact your break even, how do sales impact your break even, and so on and so forth. And then the website, I guess, for my company is agmarket.net. But, you know, any of those ways are, are a good way to be able to learn more about kind of what I do. And, uh, but again, that uh, newsletter through channel, I mean, it's, there's no obligation. You just uh, read it if you want to uh, read it if you don't read it if you don't want to, but you'll have it delivered automatically to your inbox three times a week. And, uh, you know, a lot of people, I believe uh, from what they've told me, at least have found it useful. So I think that uh, people sign up for it. They'd, they'd enjoy it. Yeah. I, I honestly, I, I've always enjoyed reading as well. I've, I've gotten it for a while, even in my previous roles and, um, no, always, always enjoyed your newsletter. Um, well, hey, hey, that's it from my list. Is there anything else you wanted to chime in on or talk about? Yeah, I mean, one thing I wanted to do is just ask you, I mean, obviously you've got a new role here uh, recently. Uh, just kind of wondering, I know you've been in and around the channel brand and know uh, all kinds of things about the channel brand, but uh, just kind of wondering about your new role and uh, how you see it uh, fitting for you and uh, just talk about it a little bit. No, I, I appreciate you asking, Matt. And no, so I, I, I just joined the channel team as the channel brand manager and r really enjoying it so far. Uh, we, a great group of people. And that's what excites me the most is, is the people you're surrounded by, right? The people you get to partner with, the people you get to work with. So only in the been in the role a little bit, but uh, really excited to jump two feet first. And I think I'll uh, get a chance hopefully to bump into you at Farm Progress. I know we got that coming up. So that'll really be one of the... Uh, first or second large events, a part of the channel brand I'll get to attend and looking forward to, to seeing folks out there. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I'm looking forward to being at Farm Progress Show. I'll be around the channel tent some. Uh, I'm going to be doing a little speaking. I want to, Case IH is going to have me speak for them, uh, I, I believe every day at 1030. So, you know, if someone comes out to Farm Progress Show and they don't catch me at the tent, uh, they can definitely catch me there because if I don't show up there, then I'm going to have some pretty unhappy uh, red <laughs> red equipment people. But, uh, you know, uh, I'll be there uh, pretty much all three days. So uh, looking forward to being there and being able to see some uh, familiar faces. You bet. Well, hey, Matt, it, it's been great to have you today on Around the Farm. And I, I know you're in your vehicle, so do drive safe today. And uh, thank you again for your time. Absolutely. I appreciate you guys having me. Thank you to Matt Bennett for joining us today. I also want to thank you, our listeners. If you enjoyed this podcast, please like and share this episode with a friend. This has been Around the Farm brought to you by Climate Field View and Channel. Don't miss any of our episodes. You can follow us wherever you listen to podcasts. Though Clint Schaffer will be joining you on the next episode, I hope to see you all again soon around the farm.